Welcome everyone to the second annual Tusker Tales. Um, I've had the good fortune to work with Ampath in um, many capacities uh, over the course of the last three, uh, few years. Lily and Ampath um, have a really special and unique relationship starting in 2002 um, with product donations that have now surpassed $100 million. And uh, from 2016 and 2017, engaging our employees and using their talents um, to aid in Eldoret and um, to also partnering with Ampath Oncology to bring cancer care closer to the community level for those with breast and cervical cancer. But my greatest fortune isn't that I've worked with Ampath, it's that I actually now call all of you friends, and I truly mean that. Um, you've brought something to my life that I consider to be a gift, and I hope that I can continue to give that back to all of you. And at a time when um, I think the world around us feels a little bit bleak. We've got devastation from Hurricane Harvey, um, threats of nuclear war, um, and just ugliness sometimes between individuals. I'm really, really grateful for this evening with everyone um, to share stories. Stories of love and stories of compassion, stories of discovery, um, stories of greatness, and stories of the human spirit and our own personal and individual unique stories that weave all of us together um, to be part of this beautiful tapestry that is Ampath. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to your first storyteller. Jenny Benziger is Assistant Professor of Clinical Medicine and Pediatrics for IU School of Medicine, Eskenazi Health, and she's also the Assistant Director of Education at the IU Center for Global Health. Jenny was one of a small number of residents selected to join the inaugural group of residents in the Global Health Residency Track in 2011, and she traveled to Kenya in 2013. She'll be telling a story titled Laundry. Hello. So a few months after I started my job as Assistant Director of Education, Bob Einhardt walked into my office and started chatting. Um, and abruptly, he stopped and said, why do you have a picture of laundry in your office? And so I think I stuttered out something at the moment, but here's the full answer, Bob. So, so it really starts with the, the laundry room in my house growing up, which was a sunny room just off the kitchen, painted yellow. I was one of four rambunctious kids um, who loved being outside, and you can imagine that there was a lot of laundry at our house. Um, laundry was everyone's job, and there was rarely a day when you couldn't hear the whoosh, whoosh, whoosh of the washer as it turned out another load. We had a lot of family lore surrounding laundry too, um, and we would spend time talking about how my brother would never fall asleep when he was a baby unless he was in his car seat on the dryer, which made everybody nervous, um, or the black elf that just stole one sock from every pair and hid it until we were all drive, driven to distraction. And my grandmother, a true Midwestern blend of pride and practicality, was always telling us to make sure we had clean underwear without holes in it, just in case we were in an accident on the highway. <laughs> so for years, I never even questioned that people might have other worries if they were in a roadside trauma. <laughs> so, in fact, just last week, or a couple months ago, I was in a fender bender, and I sat there thinking on the highway, well, at least I have clean underwear on. <laughs> When my husband and I arrived in Kenya in 2013, the walk to work quickly became a favorite part of my day. The sidewalk was only partially completed and the rich red dust crunched underneath my shoes as we walked. It was a calm start to the morning, um, unlike the busyness of rushing to work here. We would trade smiles and salutations with Michael, the gatekeeper, as we walked out. Um, we'd watch the cows sashay along the path just past the pink temple. And we'd nod to the man selling suckers on the side of the road that tasted like watered down Kool-Aid. I'm sure there's better routes into the hospital, but the one we knew of was right in the back through the morgue. Um, the long cinder block building has high windows and lovely flowers and a bright blue rain barrel outside. In the afternoons, families would gather outside the morgue as the morgue workers loaded up a casket onto the back of a pickup truck. And however many family was there at the time, five, 10, 20 people would all get in the back of the pickup truck together, causing the frame of the truck to creak and groan. In the morning, though, the area was usually quiet. 
After walking past the morgue, you walk up a long ramp to the hospital. And that ramp just never, made to, never failed to make me pause, mostly because of how easy it was to go the other direction for our patients to go down from the hospital into the morgue. In so many ways, the rest of the day we would spend fighting that path of least resistance, the path down to death, the path down to another hope loss, to another family grieving. So every medicine we tried to find, every lab we wrote, every tea sheet we tried to hunt down, was all an effort to push back the seemingly relentless tide that called the patient to the end. But as you walk up that ramp to the hospital, if you stop at about halfway up and you look out one side through the fence, you see laundry swinging in the breeze. It's just an ordinary thing, really. Women would gather and chat as they hung up a garment or two, and siblings of our pediatric patients would be running around squealing, just like my kids do it here at home. There were bright, blocky patterned skirts and the cool, thin um, cloths that the mothers would use to cool their, their children's fevered foreheads. The sunlight filtered through the trees overhead and the cool morning air filled our lungs. We'd savor that moment, aware that when we got up the ramp into the hospital, we'd almost be instantly surrounded with things to do, patients to check on, and colleagues to learn with. Once in the hospital, I'd greet the nurses. Sister Martha, how are you? How's your family? How, are, how is everything going? And then I would turn to the question that I had to ask. Sister, how many died overnight? More than anything, that moment before I walked into the hospital, enjoying the laundry swinging in the breeze, helped me remember the humanity of the patients that would fill my heart and mind for the rest of the day. Those patients, though I didn't speak their language and often couldn't understand so much about why things were the way they were in Kenya, um, they had laundry, just like me, siblings, just like me, mothers that probably made them help with chores, just like mine did. Any temptation there was to get calloused would be diffused as I walked outside and reminded myself how alike we really were. So, back to my office. Ampeth has done some really amazing things, and one that should never go ignored is that it has chosen to bring students along every single step of the way. More than 1,016 U.S. students in training and residents have been to Kenya since it's the program inception, and almost 300 Kenyan people have been here as a part of our exchange program. U.S. students like Joe, who had been on many medical trips in college for one week here or there, but came back from Kenya telling me that he had seen a better way, a way of lasting true collaboration with the community um, that really made impactful change. And Kenyan registrars like Pauline, who laughed with amazement as she saw me wrap up my newborn just like she had seen Kenyan mothers do when she was a girl. It's these students that we bring alongside us as we care for patients and we do research and it's for these students that I spend my days trying to come up with ways to teach them about their fellow humans across the globe who have hopes and dreams and families and laundry. Jim Lemons is a renowned neonatologist at Riley Hospital and former director of the neonatal perinatal medicine division at the Department of Pediatrics for the Indiana University School of Medicine. Jim is no stranger to Kenya as he's been traveling there for over 20 years. He led efforts to raise over $3 million to build the Riley Mother Baby Hospital in Kenya, which opened in 2009, where more than 20,000 babies are now born every year. Tonight, Jim will tell, us to tell a story called Everyone's Child. Um, as mentioned, our, our journey, our family's journey with uh, the IU Kenya program started uh, in 1994. And we've been over at least once a year since that time. Um, it's become a very rich part of our lives and has connected us to almost endless opportunities and endless people with countless stories. And the story I wanted to share tonight is one of connection and it's one of grace. And yeah, <laughs> grace moments, Bob was right. So it's a good story. Started uh, about 10 years ago, uh, one Saturday morning, I got a page from one of the faculty and said, uh, there was a silent auction that night at the International School where their kids uh, went to school, and there was a photo of a young Kenyan boy that she thought I would like, and I couldn't go that night, but I said, put a bit on it. Two weeks later, she brought it in. I hung it up in the office, 
Uh, my wife reminded me that uh, at that time, uh, our church, Second Presbyterian Church, had just started a, uh, uh, an art exhibit in our community room uh, around mission. And she said, why don't you add this to the exhibit? So I did, and she said, call it everyone's child. So here's the photo. Uh, it's about four feet tall, three feet wide, stitched into the plain black frame with, uh, with a string. And uh, compelling countenance, you know, these penetrating eyes in the shadows. Um, we, we had it up for about two months at Second Press, and hundreds of people saw it, walked by it. A lot commented on it, and each seemed to have a different take on the story that this little boy shared. Well, the next uh, spring, I, I returned and put it up in my office, and the next spring, I got an email from somebody I didn't know at St. Luke's Methodist Church saying uh, uh, they were bringing a man over from Eldoret, Kenya, and uh, he, his name is Joshua and Bithy. Uh, he and his wife, who's a nurse, had started a, um, an orphanage for uh, HIV-positive children, and would I like to meet him? The orphanage is called Naima, which in Swahili means grace. So I said, sure, I'd love to meet him. So he came over that summer for a month and invited him down to Riley. A staff person, her husband, an ER physician came. Uh, one of the associate ministers, Stan Abel, came. I toured him around Riley, I told him who James Whitcomb Riley was, uh, our famous poet, showed him the newborn intensive care unit that I work in, a couple of miracle stories that happen every day at, uh, in that environment, and then some about our research. We went back to my office, we're sitting around the small table, uh, and just uh, kind of recollecting, and then started sharing our journeys. Joshua was sitting opposite this photo. He got around to me, and I, uh, we were talking about our kids, and I, I told about our three kids, and, uh, and my older son, who was 33 at the time, and had, um, he would say he did the five university, eight major, 13-year program. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like a lot longer than that. He's still on, this journey, still on this journey, but his seventh major was in piano in Nebraska, and, his journey, and then he went on to get a master's in music at Butler. During that time, uh, he had uh, revealed the language of music, the actual language of music. He's the first to ever do this. It's in rainbow-colored geometry. It's a simple language. He can uh, visualize live music, uh, every instrument and voice, now in three-dimension, mathematically precise, rainbow-colored geometry. All of the five people at the table were amateur musicians, and so they, I showed it to him on the app that uh, this, he can discover it before uh, smartphones, but now with smartphones, you could show it uh, in three dimension and listen to the music, so we did that. Ken went on to then uh, patent a new way to visualize any sound, not just musical notation. And at that point, I, I shared with these five, I said, you know, I just, told Ken that I thought maybe he had uncovered one of the language, excuse me, <laughs> one of the languages of God, which Ken doesn't like me to <laughs> talk about, but um, at the moment, I, I got teary, uh, all four got teary, because uh, theoretically, with enough computing power, uh, it might be possible to visualize in four dimension over time, mathematically precise, rainbow-colored geometry every frequency or oscillation or resonance in the cre ongoing creation. And so there are two ministers there, and they paused, and, and we did. We got, it was a spiritual moment, and that's when Joshua leaned over and pointed to this picture and said, that's my son. So it took our breath away as well. It turned out his name is Johnston Mbaka. He was five years old has HIV and is being treated with antiretrovirals through the EMPATH program. It was one of 27 children that Miriam and Joshua had adopted at that point, now over 50. Well, we got close during his visit, and then he went back to Kenya. A few months later, I went to Eldoret with two colleagues, and when I got there, I called over from the IU house 
to name a house because we hadn't visited there. And his wife, Miriam, answered the phone. I didn't think I'd ever met Miriam. Well, it turned out, she said, Dr. Lemons, do you remember Dr. Peter Agua? And I said, sure, our first visit there, he was a Kenyan surgeon. He saved my life, actually, a couple of times um, at Paul's Bakery the first time. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, I, th I think you attended the cesarean section of our first, I'm sorry, of our third child. And I said, was this over at Limo House, a small private hospital? And she said, yes. And I said, I remember because um, he asked me to come and attend the C-section, take care of the baby of a very important woman who was a nurse. He was healthy. He's now six feet tall, just graduating from the University of Nairobi. So um, we spent a few hours there uh, at Nema House with all of the children, 27 children. And I actually got to hold. Uh, Uh, John Stone, who was five, now he's 14, just preparing to take his examinations for secondary school. Very vibrant young man. So after that, I returned home. Uh, I joined Power of One, which is the St. Luke's Methodist group that supports Nama House. Chaired it for a couple of years, still on the board and actively seeking. We head back to see Joshua and Miriam next week. Uh, we're going back to Kenya. They become very close friends. And as I say, they're connected to us by Nema, by Grace. Thank you. So our next speaker is Grace, which is no coincidence, I'm certain. Grace Mwangeka recently arrived from Eldoret as in a fourth year medical student at Moy University School of Medicine. She's here for a six week rotation at Eskenazi Hospital. For more than 25 years, Indiana University and Moy University have partnered in this bilateral exchange. Her story is Asante Sada. I would like to tell you a story, a very short story. It's a story of gratitude, a story of uh, six young Kenyans who set out on a life-changing adventure, I'd call it. I am one of those six young Kenyans. So we are from Eldoret, Moy University. We are here for a six-week rotation, as you've been told. We have been here for about four weeks now. Um, so I didn't know what I would say when I was told that I had to speak here. <laughs> but, then, but then, you know, everyone seems to think that I'm this outgoing person, but really I'm not. I'm an introvert. Don't be deceived. Uh, so we had this debriefing session last week with our coordinator. His name is Ron. Ron Pettigrew, I think some of you know him. He has taken care of us throughout our stay here. He's like um, Sarah Ellen Mamlin. She's back home in Kenya. She's a long, uh, staff, long time staff member of the Ampath program. She calls us herself our mother hen, and rightly so, because she was with us when we went to get our passports, our visas. She made us these little goodie bags to take with us on the journey coming here. It was filled with toiletries and some small snacks we could have on our journey to the airport. So she's an amazing woman. She did that for 20 people, so you can imagine. She's amazing. Um, so the debrief session was mainly to just um, come up with a list of the positives and the things that could be improved on that we, we saw during our experience so far. Um, so it got me reflecting and uh, it helped me to come up with the things that I want to share with you tonight. So, so far our experience has been interesting. I can say on behalf of the team that we have handled it fairly well, everything being so new. Um, we are learning from, uh, from everyone, from everything. We're enjoying the good things. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's been interesting from the long flights, from uh, the, the long days here, you know, back home, the sun sets at like six, you know, here we have to wait till nine. So it was like, <laughs> I wonder how it can still be light at nine, but we're getting used to it. Um, also uh, the food, it's quite interesting. Uh, crossing the roads, you know, back home, it's a jungle, and the cars have right of way. So here it's, I'd call it a refreshing sobriety of traffic. <laughs> so
so yeah, it's, it's been interesting. And also the heat, it's quite hot here compared to Kenya. Um, and then also the clinical exposure, what brought us here. So um, I wish I had a story of how bravely we, we, we bore some turbulence in the air along the flight that we came with, but I don't have such a story. <laughs> I think we were cool, you know. Many of us for sure have not been on a flight before, but so it, it, was, it was a highlight. Um, one interesting thing though, when we came here was how cold it is. It was so cold whenever we got into any building. It's cold right now for me. <laughs> any building, any car that we got into was so cold and then outside it's so hot. So, you know, <laughs> we're wondering how is that? Back in Kenya, if it's hot inside, it's hot outside. So, yeah. And so a funny story, uh, we were out one time in the first days with Ron. We had gone for lunch, we had some errands to run. So uh, we had to go get drinks. Uh, and then, you know, we see everyone getting ice. And then, you know, the drinks with, you know, some part that comes out with ice. So one of us goes up there and, you know, we don't know how that ice was coming out. But we want to get the ice because it's so hot. So, of course, everyone here is so kind. And I think they got some assistance. So they ended up filling that cup with so much ice, you know, there was little room for the drink. And so, you know, we go back, we have lunch, you know, we're in such a hurry because we have so many things to do. And in the end, the person ended up, you know, having almost no drink because, you know, they didn't know. But now we know how to get our own ice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the food. The food's new. It's interesting. It's delicious, though. Uh, it's quite different from Ugali. I think the people who've been to Kenya know what Ugali is. It's like corn. That's what you guys call it here. Don't let anyone deceive you if you've not been to Kenya. It's, 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 it's delicious, so just try it for yourself before you, yeah, before you make any, any, any conclusions. Uh, so my personal favorite is the quesadilla. Uh, and then among us, I think they are natural lovers in my group. So I think it's a draw between American food and Mexican food. So we'll see who wins by the time we go. Uh, so, what brought us here is the clinical exposure. So um, first I'd like to say that Eskenazi is a very, very beautiful hospital and we are glad to be uh, a part of it for this short period of time. Uh, it has beautiful, uh, it's, it's beautiful and the staff are so wonderful. The medical students are ready to share the knowledge that they have as well as the staff, they're ready to teach you. Um, and um, at some point I felt like I was in those medical drama series, but this is different because it's real. I'm learning and I'm growing and it's making me, you know, it's growing me into, become, into becoming a better professional. So uh, we are grateful for this opportunity. Um, and the technology here is amazing. We don't have, a, we don't swipe to unlock doors back home or wave for a door to just open or we're not paperless, you know, back home it's like a paper jungle. So we, we are glad to see these things and we'll share this experience with others and hopefully it will create some change back home. So I want to say lastly that we are grateful to be here and represent our country, Kenya. Thank you for welcoming us. You are welcome to our country as well. Thank you for being a part of our adventure, for teaching us. Uh, I hope we find our way back here through the same partnership in future. Uh, we've got many lessons to learn. We've been challenged for the better. Mm, and I believe that when we go back home, we shall be different. There'll be a change in how we participate in patient care back home. Um, because we're not the same young Kenyans who set foot here four weeks ago. We are different and we are better. Asante Sana Ampath and IU and all who support this program. Thank you. David Crabb had the chance to visit Eldoret three times and serve as, a t as, as attending physician on the medicine wards twice. Those experiences were important in directing his main interest toward care of vulnerable patients and taking his current position as Chief Medical Officer for Eskenazi Health. He will tell his story titled, Bedside Teaching and Learning. Thank you. I hope you like the tie. I got it the last time I was there in exchange for a pen light <laughs> from one of the interns. Um, the chance to be an attending physician on the wards in Kenya um, really rekindled for me a love of clinical medicine and bed bedside teaching. And so I thought I would talk about a, a woman that I remember frequently and talk about frequently because of what she taught me. She is what we would kind of call an interesting case, which is something you don't want to be, 
you don't want to have a disease or, or a process that others want to come in and see because it's uncommon. She had HIV. She was in her 20s, I think. She had tuberculosis, and she had a kind of tuberculosis that goes to the brain. So it's in the, the fluid around the brain. It's called tuberculous meningitis. It's a very bad thing to have. Well, she had a number of, of interesting findings uh, on rounds. For one thing, when we tested how her eyes would move, they didn't move together. It's a test for the nerves that control the movement of the eye, and it was abnormal because of the meningitis. She had a funny, a funny sign that I've never seen before or since. You tap the cheek here on the facial nerve, and the face twitches. And you may have read about it, but you'll never see it. It's got a funny name, Schwastok, uh, Schwastek sign. It means her blood calcium was low. Don't know why she had that. She had a little white spot on her chest. We thought it was a, a boil or something like that. As we got close to it, the little white thing had ribs. It was a larva, and she had a fly larva under the skin, which is called myiasis. And at about this time, my 14-year-old daughter, who was with us, was escorted outside and nearly fainted into Jody Skiles' arms from this uh, observation. She had something that I'll have to come back to to tell you about. She had sort of an orange stain on her uh, gown, on her, on her um, hospital gown. And then a few days later, uh, she made a funny sound when she was breathing, and it's called the death rattle. And I wondered, I wanted to know when I was preparing for this a little bit more about why we use this funny term. It's the sound that you make if you can't clear and cough the stuff that accumulates in your, in your windpipes. So if you get weaker and weaker, sicker, and you're near death, you make this sound. But why do we call it? Where did this rattle term come from? Well, it comes, it comes from the man who invented the stethoscope. There was a French physician named uh, Lanec. He worked in a tuberculosis hospital in France around 1800 at a time when about one in six people in Europe were infected with tuberculosis. It was just absolutely rampant. And uh, he was taking care of these patients. He developed the stethoscope. At that time, it was just a wooden cylinder that he could put on his ear and on the chest of the patient, supposedly because it would respect the modesty of a, a female patient, because apparently otherwise you put your ear on the chest to listen to what was going on. And since he was the first person to hear what was going on in the chest, he named what he heard. And he had four interesting things, and he, and he used a French word, rals. And rals comes from a, a, a verb, rale, and rale can be translated a whole bunch of sound words, like cr crackle, grunt, groan, sigh, wheeze, that sort of thing, but also rattle. So what he was saying when he said someone had rals was that there was a rattling sound. And he knew there was the rattling sound that you could hear from the bedside, the death rattle. And there were other sounds, he called them sonorous and sibilant and crepitant. He had a much better vocabulary than we do nowadays. I think if we discovered a new sign, we would call them awesome rawls <laughs> or something like that. But he didn't, he had those names. But then he was very sensitive about this because he knew that to the family or the patient, if he used this term rawls for the other sounds he was hearing with the stethoscope, they would hear him say rattle and therefore they'd be concerned, they'd think they were going to die, that they had the death rattle and it was the end for them. So he changed the name for sort of public consumption to a, another funny word that's only known in your physical exam textbooks called ronchus. It's an old Greek word that is sort of like a snoring or wheezing sound. So then there were 200 years of confusion in medicine with people not knowing how to call Rawls, Ronchi, all this, and in 1977 a group of lung doctors got together and abolished them. Now we still use them because they're cool words and so on, but we now call them wheezes and crackles. So that is a bit of a diversion back to a, to a physician 200 years ago taking care of the same kind of person that I was taking care of, but with a different reason, not HIV, but with the tuberculosis. So, to return to our patient, on the day we heard the death rattle, over the next couple of hours while we were rounding, it got quieter and quieter, and she died on the ward. And I don't remember exactly when it was that I figured out the fifth, um, the fifth physical finding, which was that orange spot, but I finally did. And the orange spot was there because one of the medicines you give for tuberculosis is called rifampin, and rifampin is a bright orange-yellow. And what was happening was she was being given the medicine but she couldn't swallow it. She couldn't swallow it because the nerves that run her throat, just like the nerves that ran her eyes, weren't working because of the disease. And we didn't pick up on it, and she lost her chance because we didn't deliver 
the treatment that we thought we were. And you can think of a lot of parallels. There's a lot of treatment we deliver that doesn't actually get there, either because the patient can't afford it, can't pick it up, doesn't trust us, doesn't understand the instructions or whatever. So I think about that. And then I summarize, and I will summarize this more often uh, on teaching rounds. Um, there are maybe three different kinds of bedside signs that we want to pay attention to. The first is the kind of signs that you really need to know if you're a doctor, like do your eyes move, does your throat work? You got to know how to do this because it's so fast and so efficient, uh, you just have to do this to make diagnoses efficiently. There's a second kind that is fun to do, but it's not essential. It's like knowing what Schwastek sign is because you're it's just historically of interest, or what this funny larva in the chest means. But then there are the signs that you get at the bedside that you gotta pay real close attention to. And that's the sort of stuff like the orange spot. When the patient is trying to tell you something, may not have the words for it, but it's essential to what you have to do to help the patient. And I think that's the deepest lesson of bedside teaching. Thank you. Neil Flick serves as the Finance and Business Administrator for Ampath Oncology. Neil started his global health career in 2008, serving in various leadership positions with Mercy Ships in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Togo, and Ghana. He joined Ampath Oncology in 2014 as the IU Simon Cancer Center staff embedded within the IU Center for Global Health based in Indianapolis. In this capacity, He's charged with, with managing the financial and business aspects of Ampath Oncology to facilitate clinical care, research, and educational infrastructure. His story is called, Be Careful What You Ask For. Kuyamba, welcome. As uh, mentioned, I am the bean counter for oncology uh, and your token non-MD speaker for tonight. <laughs> So if any of you need to use the restroom or get a refill, you've got about six minutes and 30 seconds <laughs> to do that. <laughs> One of the things that I get to do a lot uh, when I travel to Kenya is host first-time guests. Be coworkers going for the first time. It could be supporters that we've got currently or future supporters. Uh, part of those responsibilities entail giving them very specific instructions on what to do, how to get there what airlines to use, what hotels to stay in, and different things like that. Uh, one of the large topics that we cover are food. There is a certain cuisine in Kenya that I call brown sauce. And this is uh, sort of like a beef bouillon cube based spice. Uh, they add this to just about everything. They put it um, on beef, so you have beef flavored beef, you'll have beef-flavored chicken, beef-flavored vegetables, <laughs> and if you're very lucky, you will also have beef-flavored fruit. <laughs> uh, when you're there uh, for a certain period of time, you have to learn to improvise uh, for your comfort food. So we will make biscuits and gravy, sort of. Uh, we will make tacos, sort of, uh, and different things like that. Um, we advise people um, when they're going out to eat, what types of food would be good, what preparation methods are okay to uh, take that food, and what you should stay away from. We've got certain people um, over here that are the street food warriors, and they don't like to listen to any of those things, and end up we can uh, confirm that there are indeed active volcanoes in Kenya. Uh, we have found some restaurants that cater a bit to the Western likes uh, with their menu. They will have pizzas. They even deliver sometimes. Uh, they've got Chinese food. Um, we haven't found Mexican food there yet. Sorry, guys, with the quesadillas, you're not going to find those. <laughs> um, but we found one restaurant in particular. It was somewhat new called The Big Five, who serves burgers. And... Uh, this is a large excitement for me, if you couldn't tell that I liked burgers, as well as <laughs> one of my close colleagues over here in my twin shirt, Dave. Uh, we went to check this restaurant out, see if this rumor was true that there were burgers involved. Um, they did have burgers involved. It was a very large selection, a huge menu. They had all kind of things. You put egg, cheese, all kind of stuff on a burger. In our excitement, we ordered hamburgers and fries. And when the meal came out, we got exactly what we asked for. It was ham on a hamburger bun <laughs> and fries. 
we had to go back a few more times to, to get that right. Uh, but eventually, we've got our nickname, the No No Mazungus, there, and they know what we're going to order. <laughs> you also get to uh, learn a lot about your coworkers when you're in Kenya. We've got a lot of coworkers from a lot of different backgrounds. Uh, one of them in particular, who's a, a former coworker, um, had a little trouble following directions. When you get to IU House, they will give you an orientation. They'll show you where things are at, give you the laundry scoop, all kind of things like that, in addition to telling you about the buttons to press in the event of an emergency. Um, I don't know if she was not paying attention or what was going on or what she thought her emergency was, but there were two mornings in a row that the restroom emergency button was pushed and the sort of equivalent of a SWAT team from Kenya would show up and surround the house and try to flesh out what the problem was. <laughs> After the second morning, it, we realized it was one person pushing that as an extra boost to the toilet flush. <laughs> also, you learn the value of a Purdue engineering degree that one of your colleagues holds uh, when that colleague happens to be the only one that can't seem to figure out how to work the instant hot water in the shower. And when I say colleague, I really mean my boss, who's not here tonight to defend himself. <laughs> uh, the other hat that I wear in my role involves hosting a number of our partners. We've got a lot of Lilly folks that we host that go over, Pfizer folks, uh, Celgene folks, among many others uh, that we host in the oncology program. And as a part of that, we like to show them our operations, introduce our colleagues to them, uh, show them around, and that typically involves some cultural immersion. So we have a reception or a party for them, and we like to have some traditional music there, some traditional food, the namachoma, the ugali, like Grace mentioned, sakuma wiki, uh, some kachumbari, uh, and different things like that. Um, in an effort to kind of accommodate these Western tastes uh, that people have and preferences, uh, the last time that we did this reception, we requested a couple tubs for ice uh, so that we could um, have ice drinks for people. It's not very common in Kenya to find uh, chilled drinks, and so that was one of the things that we thought might be nice for this group coming over. We arrived at the venue, and there were the nice white tablecloths. There were the fire pits scattered all around the lawn. This very beautiful cake that we had ordered uh, that one of our coworkers had made. And right in the middle of all that, there were two of the most filthy, disgusting used bathtubs full of ice <laughs> for the drinks that we had ever seen. So I encourage you when you go to Kenya to be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Additionally, for Deb, Haley, and Megan, be careful who you ask to give a Tusker Tale speech because I learned most of my Swahili from taxi drivers. <laughs> Kuyamba, thank you. Megan McHenry is finishing up a pediatric research fellowship here at Indiana University and will be joining the Pediatric Infectious Disease and Global Health faculty in October. She's been traveling to Kenya intermittently over the last six and a half years during her medical school pediatrics residency and fellowship training and is the North American Secretary for AMPATH's Pediatric Research Working Group. Her husband, Adam, also went to Eldoret during his fourth year at medical school, and they hope to take their two young sons there in the near future. Her story is titled, Greatness Lies in You. So during a recent trip to Kenya, I got really into the musical Hamilton, like really into the musical. And after I memorized the cast album, um, I started listening to interviews with its creator, Lin-Manuel Miranda. And in one of his interviews, he said something really interesting. He said, when great people cross your path, it forces you to reckon with what you're doing with your life. And um, of course, he was talking about Alexander Hamilton. But since I was in Kenya, my mind immediately goes to Joe and Sarah Ellen Mamlin, Bob Einhurst, Jim Lemons, and these like pillars of greatness. And then when I start to reckon with what I'm doing with my life, it makes me feel overwhelmed and pretty inadequate, because there's no way that I could be as smart or compassionate or forward-thinking as they are. But then I thought for a few moments more, and then I realized the dozens and dozens and dozens of people that I encounter whenever I'm in Kenya or um, working with people at Ampath that 
um, I've watched the actions that they do, how they treat other people, and they've really made a big impact on how uh, I live my life. And so I wanted to share two of the stories with you from my um, first trip to Kenya in medical school. So as a fourth year medical student, I knew I was gonna go into pediatrics, and so the Orphans and Vulnerable Children's program was particularly interesting to me. So um, I asked Elizabeth Chester to take me down um, one day with her, and we drove down into the Rift Valley, and the first house that we went to um, was just a single room. It was made of mud, um, the hut was. And there was a single mother there um, who was caring for multiple school-aged children. And so she had requested um, of Elizabeth to have a sleeping mat because one of her children were sleeping on the floor. And I thought, oh, this is so easy. Uh, mats are inexpensive. I brought money with me. I could just give her money for a mat right now, and then we could help her. And when I turned to Elizabeth, to give her my idea, she looked very stern, and she was talking to the mom, and so Hila, I didn't understand, but after a while, she turned to me and said that this mother was receiving resources from the OVC, including school fees for her children, but the children weren't attending school regularly. So she had spent time talking to the mom, figuring out what the barriers were for the children to go to school, how they could get around them, and they made a deal that if the children were going to school consistently, that she would bring by sleeping mats for them. And this is the first time I had ever thought of help in this way. My, my, um, my traditional view of help is just if someone has a need, you address it. Like if they're hungry, you feed them. If they're naked, you clothe them. And this was different, and I wasn't quite sure what to think of it at the moment. Um, and the next family that we went to was a pair of grandparents that were taking care of uh, their grandchild. And it was clear that they loved him very much but um, they were also ashamed of caring for him because he was HIV infected and abandoned by his parents, and they were too embarrassed to take him to clinic, so he wasn't receiving any care. So Elizabeth talked to their family for a long time, and um, again, I didn't know what they were saying, but I could understand their body language, and it was initially very tense, and both sides were a little bit um, angry, and but then, Slowly by slowly, poly poly, um, you could see that you know um, Elizabeth softened, the grandparents softened, and eventually the grandfather said that he wanted to take care of the child, and he actually took the child to the empath clinic that day while we were there. And it was after that moment that I realized Elizabeth's greatness, and that she took the time to really get to know the families that she was working with, um, to understand their struggles, to be able to think in the future to maybe meet their goals in the long term and not just um, meet what they need at the moment. And so from that instance and working with her, it really changed my view of what help is. And, and that changed what I do in Kenya and then also how I help at home. So, and that was just from one afternoon that I spent with her, um, but it doesn't take an afternoon. Um, the second story I wanted to share is of a sixth year Kenyan medical student named Joseph Masharia. Um, it was about a week or two into our clinical rotation, um, and the other IU students and I really hadn't made any Kenyan friends yet. And it made me feel bad, and I kind of isolated while I was there. Um, and one day when we were walking from the hospital back to the hostels, there was just a downpour, like a soaky to the bone kind of downpour. And we must have looked very pathetic whenever we were walking up the steps to the hostel, because Mash, or Joseph, had yelled out his window for us to come to his room. And normally, I'm like very hesitant about going to strangers' rooms. Um, but he was the first Kenyan student that actually had addressed us directly, so I felt like we had to go. Um, so we dried off and went to his room, and he had hot tea and biscuits waiting for us. And we just sat down and chatted with him. He, um, we talked about our experiences in the exchange. He explained that the students were taking exams, and they were very stressed. And that was probably why they hadn't really reached out to us yet. He told us about his experiences the prior year going to Sweden during his exchange, and it was wonderful. And we weren't there for more than an hour, but I felt like my time in Kenya had already changed. I felt much more at home and welcomed. And then the other Kenyan students must have noticed that he talked to us because they also opened up and were more inviting and engaging with us while we were there. And so just that little bit of time that probably didn't mean that much to Mash, he probably was just like, felt sorry for us and wanted to, to extend a welcoming hand, but it changed us during that rotation, it changed the students that got to watch his actions, and it changed the way that I um, interact with the Kenyan students and then the pediatric registrars that come over. It makes me 
um, much more um, much more forceful about like, making them be engaged and making sure that they feel welcome. And it was just from just an hour of his time that he spent with us. And so, in summary, um, as the great George, General George Washington had once said in the musical Hamilton, that greatness lies in you, and it lies in all of us, and it doesn't have to be this huge lifelong achievement or this huge inspiring thing that is greatness. It could just be the things you do day to day, how you treat other people, and how you might inspire other people to reckon with what they're doing with your life. And the people at Ampath really did that for me, and I'm so grateful for that. So thank you. Adam Cantor is a, neighbor, is a native of Indianapolis and graduate of North Central High School. He graduated from the Indiana University Jacobs School of Music with a degree in guitar performance and is an accomplished guitarist, as you know from hearing in, in the reception downstairs. And I want to personally thank you for playing Here Comes the Sun. It's my favorite. Um, you should check, it, check out his YouTube channel, Adam Cantor Music. Well, in his fourth year of medical school at IU, Adam had the honor and opportunity to join the AMPATH Exchange Program and learn at Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital in Eldoret, Kenya. Adam is continuing his Hoosier streak and is currently an ophthalmology resident at IU. His story is called The Travel Guitar. You have been accepted to the Kenya AMPATH Medical Student Exchange Program. It was music to my ears. I had long hoped for this opportunity but I had to wait and found out with short notice that I finally got my shot. And boy, did I get a lot of shots, two in each arm. <laughs> and then a, a short time later, I found myself uh, trying to learn Swahili on an app on my phone while I sat on my first of four flights to Eldoret, Kenya. I also had my travel guitar stowed in the bin above me in the airplane. The first chance I had to take my guitar out was at the Tumaini Innovation Center, a place where local street youth are taken in and learn sustainable farming, technology, and other skills that enable them to become leaders and role models in their communities. There were a few guitars there and many eager young guitarists, but no teacher. Now, you can't learn guitar in a day, but everyone already has the tools to explore new sounds and work together which are fundamental ingredients for forming a band. So we divided roles. One of my new bandmates took over percussion. I showed that the guitar is really a percussive instrument. You can do a lot of tapping sound. And then one of my other bandmates, I showed him this cool technique where you can strum way over here and get this. And then I played some chords. And I'll play the result. All I have on my, my phone here is a, is a grainy uh, recording, but uh, just in a, a few moments, we were, we were jamming, and it was a lot of fun. So here, let's see if this plays. So that was a lot of fun. <laughs> the most incredible day that I had in Kenya when I had, was when I had the opportunity to visit three orphanages in the same day with Sarah Ellen Mamlin. And one of them was the Nima uh, school that uh, Dr. Lemons talked about. Three times in a row I pulled out my guitar and played in front of groups of 15 to 50 kids. I sang funny songs with uh, names like Shake My Sillies Out and Peace Like a River. I also learned a famous Kenyan song. Some of you might know it. It's called Jambo Buana. And I was thrilled to learn that many of the kids already knew it. The translation is, how are you? I am fine. The visitors are welcome to Kenya. No worries. If any of you know it, feel free to sing along. <laughs> Jambo. Jambo buana, habari gani, mzuri sana, wageni, wakaribishwa, Kenya yetu, hakuna matata. So, <laughs> oh, thank you. All right. 
It must have been sort of funny that a visitor to Kenya would be singing a song about welcoming visitors. <laughs> Might have been a little self-serving, but uh, they enjoyed it. Um, many of these children had lost their parents to HIV. And it was incredible to see how people came together through AMPATH and other organizations to give uh, these children a chance to have a good life. The majority of my time, however, was spent uh, at MTRH in the pediatric hospital on the Opendo 2 team. The wards were large rooms filled with beds shared by multiple patients and their family. These children were being treated for malaria, HIV, tuberculosis, severe malnutrition, advanced cancer. I did my best to learn this medical system and work with the Kenyan medical students and understand the pathology and treatment for diseases I had never encountered before. Despite an often shortage of resources, I was inspired by the hard work and de dedication of the staff and students. And I wondered if I should or could bring my guitar into this place inhabited by the sick and dying. And the answer was clearly yes. Each ward I went to with my guitar burst out in song. The children in the hospital sang with smiles just as bright as the school children outside in the sun. One of my original songs that I played is called Meteor Shower, and I'll end by playing this instrumental piece. It reflects my philosophy on life, that like a shooting star, we are small, in the universe, and our time here is over in the blink of an eye. But for our brief moment, each of us lights up the sky, and we are spectacular.
Thank you.